Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to the second session of the Nebular cohort. Um, this session, we're gonna continue learning about the, the spirit of open science, uh, the essence of open science uh, with Shad Sansing, who is here with us. He's gonna be our expert um, for, for the session. And I just want to start with a few reminders um, and that we're gonna just say for all of the sessions. Um, as always, this call is going to be recorded and transcribed. If you have to drop up early or if you um, want to watch the recording uh, later, you're welcome to do so. We take a few days to check, check the transcription and then upload that to our YouTube channel. Um, but in, so while that is ready, we also have uh, automatic captions and you can enable that um, in other AI by following the link on the um, left, upper left corner. There is a, a, a message that says, click here to open live transcript and you can see uh, the transcription over there. I also want to remind you that we have a code of conduct and that applies to all of our spaces, um, including this call, including the Slack channels. Um, so if you experience any unacceptable behavior, please let us know by emailing the, the team um, or emailing individual um, organizers like Joe Malvika, who is also a director in OLS, um, or me as well. And again, okay, one last reminder that if you prefer to participate by speaking, please add an S in front of your name. And if you prefer uh, to participate by grading, please add a W in front of your name. So those are the general announcements, but I want to take a few minutes to um, share my screen and orient ourselves around the notepad because we're gonna be using that um, a lot more this session. So let me share my screen. Yes, can you see that? Okay. Yes. Thanks. So this is the uh, this is the notepad, and we start first with a roll call. So you can all write your name here, um, and this gives you an idea of who is joining, and also gives you an idea of. Uh, who you can meet here in the breakup rooms. Um, we like to use emojis just to share a fun thing, share how we're feeling um, at the beginning of the session. And it's not that we're passing list. That's not the idea, so don't worry about that. We're just um, want you to give want to give you a space to introduce yourself to to each meeting. And again, like the notepad, works as our script for the whole meeting. So if you ever um, kind of lose sight of where we are, you can always go back to the, um, to the index on the left and you can see what section we are at the moment. So right now we were in the welcome. Uh, we also include all important information on the notepad. Um, so you don't have to memorize every, anything or write it yourself. Everything is here. And we are going to hear the first presentation by Chad, but I want to particularly um, show you how we structure the space for the break of rooms. Again, we include all the instructions here. So if you need a reminder of what we're going to do in these activities, you can just uh, read this instructions. And when you go into a breakup room, whether, whether that is uh, a grading breakup room or a speaking breakup room, what we ask you to do is to please take a moment to write the names, the people who are joining. For example, I'm going to write Irene, Shad, uh, and Joe, and then take notes of what you're discussing. So maybe the question is, um, how was your 
for what do you think about the first session? Then you can write, um, uh, I know, like, it was great. And then if you see the comment of another person and you agree with that comment, you can add, oh yeah, I agree with that. I like that. You can add, add plus one. Um, and that way other people in breakout rooms um, can just learn what you're discussing. You don't have to write everything, of course, but just general ideas of what you are learning and sharing. Um, and this paths also serve as our documentation of the meetings for people who couldn't join. And um, while, the, um, while the video is uploaded, they can look at what we're all learning and sharing. Um, also, the breakout rooms are not recorded. So um, they're gonna be able, people who don't join are going to be able to watch the presentations, but they are going to be missing out on what you're all learning and sharing. So that's another reason why we encourage everyone to use the notepad. Um, yeah, I think if you have any questions about how to use this, just let us know. Um, it's also really fun to just use emojis. So we put a link to the Emojipedia uh, at the beginning to uh, for you to copy and paste emojis. That's also a way of participation. Um, just putting, I don't know, like whatever emoji as a reaction. Uh, so feel free to use the notepad uh, to take notes, to share. And I think that's all I wanted to say about it. So I'm going to stop by screen share and um, yeah I think we're gonna start with it um, with Chad so, awesome um, I great think, yeah um, Joe um, I'll pass it to you <laughs> cool you. I was half asleep uh, working on the other window so I'm glad you said my name hey folks uh, so uh, I will be hosting a little bit of this, and I believe our first our first caller, <laughs> we're on a radio show, no, our very first presenter will be Chad talking about the basics of open science. Uh, so Chad, once we get to the end or when we get to breakout rooms, etc., I will be uh, happy to open the rooms to moderate questions, etc. Um, you'll introduce yourselves better than me, so over to you. All right, thank you. And thank you everybody for joining the call today. Hi, uh, my name is Chad Sansing. Uh, I live in traditional territory of the Monacan people known as Virginia in the United States. Use he, him pronouns. I'm the product manager at prereview.org, uh, which is an online platform and also a training community dedicated to open peer preprint review across scholarly communication. Uh, preprints right now, but uh, in the future, we hope to think about things like data sets, computational notebooks, all kinds of wonderful stuff that might be great to get you know feedback on. Uh, prior to working at pre-review, I was at the Mozilla Foundation for some time, uh, where I got to work on uh, that organization's kind of annual marquee event, MozFest, uh, but also on open leadership programming and web literacy curriculum and development, and just a lot of community and program management that first brought me into contact with folks in the open science and kind of open um, knowledge spaces. And uh, that was just great and fantastic. And I'm super happy to have continued uh, on that track to pre-review and to join you here today. And I guess I should say way, way, way back in time, I taught uh, 11 to 14 year olds, all kinds of stuff from language arts to STEM things uh, to uh, a little bit of Spanish now and again. But that that catches us up to today, where we'll be talking about the ethos of open science uh, that we're all here for. Um, for the first part of today, uh, I'm going to share with you with maybe just a, a little bit of editorializing some of the big ideas you're going to find in the curriculum for this course uh, that also connect to later modules. Uh, there'll be links to the GitHub repo, a few other online sources that I'm sure you already have, but that you can revisit if you want to go over any of this content again, see more examples, uh, perhaps glean you know a bit more technical information than I might offer today. 
And then we'll go into a breakout room that'll help us really get into that ethos or spirit of open in a, in a holistic sense. So more so than just a open software or open data, but what it means to have maybe a, an open culture or open community around the work that you're doing in open science. We'll come back together. Um, I'll share just some, some tips, some things that I've learned from open science practitioners over the years at Mozilla and pre-review, and maybe even from some younger open science practitioners back when I was teaching. And then we'll close with uh, another breakout room to kind of help you think about some actionable next steps you might take in bringing openness to the work that you're doing here with this cohort. Um, if that sounds all right to everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. All right. All right. So we're going to start with just uh, the basics of open science and some big ideas. And, you know, openness and open science can encompass an awful lot. Some folks might be thinking about um, citizen science or open software, open hardware, open data, I mean, to a certain extent, open licensing, open culture. When I think of open science, I think about all of these things operating together. Um, within a, a team or an organization, institution, a lab, but also across and between that place and the community, the audience um, that's accessing the science, learning from the science, using the science in other contexts as well. Um, just as a, as a big reminder about openness, it's never about a you know, lack of structure or, you know, just proceeding in a willy nilly manner. Uh, it's not a show of ambivalence. Uh, it is not necessarily open to those who might want to enter a community and bring harm. So open doesn't always mean open to everyone all the time for everything, but it does mean, you know, open, safe, trustworthy, protective, recognizing and nurturing communities, environments, workspaces for those who want to give. And I think about it as creating kind of virtuous loops of participation that allow people to engage with things they're deeply passionate about in the sciences, uh, to contribute to those things, and to get some kind of equitable value exchange from them, whether that's a you know internal kick from altruism, um, or if there is another kind of exchange going on, maybe a training, maybe an honorarium, it could be different things depending on uh, the people involved, uh, the resources available, things like that. Um, but that's uh, that's how I think of, of openness, something, you know, uh, bigger than any just one part of it. So when we talk about open science and particularly, I think about sharing spaces, processes, and outcomes to advance high quality science, to follow the FAIR principles. I'll, I'll try to limit the acronyms today, but there are a couple that show up in the curriculum I wanted you to have today uh, as you go forward into the rest of your work, and to build trust. And when I think about advancing high quality science, uh, you know, I, I have a little bit of bias. I work at a place called, you know, uh, a preview. So I do think about publishing early and often and in many different forms. I think about sharing a variety of outputs up to and inclusive of, but not exclusive to what might be a version of record, so to speak, um, and inviting feedback in ways that help you improve your work, but also help your audience in some way, either to advance their own work, to learn from it, um, you know, to, to, to build upon what you've done or to create recreate what you've done, reproduce what you've done in their own context for their own benefit. So I would encourage you, you know, to think about openness from your perspective, maybe as a, as a leader of a project, an initiative, a lab, an institution, an organization, um, to really think about engaging with folks and asking for feedback in ways that are generative and constructive, you know, right from the start and framed and held and perceived that way. So, you know, I, I, sometimes uh, think about asking for feedback as something that causes me, you know, anxiety, uh, or maybe it's going to be, you know, summative, judgmental. Uh, maybe there'll be an element of something, you know, punitive to it somewhere in there. If I've done a bad job, these are things that I carry with me from, you know, my, my own life and experiences uh, that I try to counter uh, through a more open approach where I think more about feedback, not as something, you know, uh, others might do to or, you know, throw at me, but how can I think of feedback as my opportunity to frame invitations for others to contribute to the work or the science or the distribution thereof? So, you know, as a way to get past kind of maybe what is the a fear of openness there that like anybody could say anything about what I'm doing, to think about really owning that space understanding strengths, understanding not necessarily weaknesses, might be 
termed as weaknesses, opportunities for improvement, places where I need to know more, but, you know, framing those asks for feedback in very specific ways that are likely to help me and that therefore will improve the work and help others. So another way to think about criticism is um, think about feedback is in an open setting is, you know, the folks who are offering this to you, whether they uh, know it or not, whether they frame it that way or not, maybe one thing that they're doing is actually just asking you for help to better understand what you're doing uh, to access it in a way that makes more sense to them. And that can be very valuable, I think, as a way to shift things uh, in an open setting as well. Um, and it can also be thought of as almost like, um, you know, user researcher testing your product, getting feedback early and often in that cycle um, can help you uh, improve the work, improve the science, improve how you distribute it, improve, you know, maybe options that you have, capacities you have, resources you have for, I don't know, translation, localization, um, collaboration, uh, cooperation with folks trying to reproduce things in different ways for their own contexts. Um, I think that's another piece of uh, working towards that advancement of high quality science by looking at feedback and the frequency of it as um, invitations to collaborate rather than as things to be anxious about, which is something I, I sometimes struggle with. Open science often follows the FAIR principles. So F-A-I-R in English. Those correlate to making things findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So uh, your work is discoverable. It's findable. Uh, the folks that find it have you know a strong chance of understanding it and understanding it maybe in many different ways depending where they're coming from uh, it's interoperable and in that it could be accessed through used on different platforms not just uh, maybe one bespoke or closed platform uh, and it's reusable right folks can take it with them to other places other contexts and use your work in new ways that maybe you have not yet imagined yet or could not imagine um, that will help them and then maybe make some return for you that will come back and help you in the future and then building trust, I think, is another big element of open science, another kind of big idea behind it, um, by learning to be more open. And again, in these ways that kind of um, protect, grow, and sustain these loops of you know feedback and sharing, you'll develop better communication about your project and with stakeholders over time. You'll create stronger communities of practice where what's being shared is better understood more quickly and used more quickly, reproducible more quickly. You'll be able to, you know, in doing that work, increase public understanding and appreciation of the work and use of your high quality science, I think. And it will help you kind of um, hold on to uh, the second of uh, two acronyms I promised today uh, that also I think show up somewhere in the curriculum there. Um, principles that have to do with IDEA, I-D-E-A in English, which would be making things inclusive, diverse, equitable, and accessible. And those all kind of like map and match up to the FAIR principles very well, I think. So future modules are going to help you in this, in this curriculum, kind of structure your spaces, your processes, and your outcomes to communicate, tool, and share your work in alignment with these goals. And in doing those things, we can work towards, you know, use those big ideas to work towards some common goals of open science, which would be collective and individual benefit, Having those accessible, diverse, equitable, inclusive, and just spaces, processes, and outcomes. Having secure data and communities. And having mutually beneficial and respectful relationships with culturally diverse communities who might provide, with, uh, provide or interact with any of those things you're working on, your processes, your data, software, hardware, results, other outputs that you can imagine that, uh, that I could not. Um, and then at the end of the day, what we all hope for, we hope to sustain over time is just increased participation in and uptake and use of the high quality science and openness is an excellent route to that. I think there are also, you know, even more benefits uh, that you can measure for with some intentionality and some mindfulness. And these are in your curriculum as well. But, you know, you can lower barriers to innovation by having open processes that invite folks who, again, can look at things, uh, perceive things, sense things act on things in ways that are different than how you might. Um, it will lead to clearer documentation for reproducibility, uh, as well as for recognition of the folks who contribute to the work. Um, that higher visibility and impact can be helpful in getting essential information to folks who could use it wherever they are in the world. Uh, it will expand and strengthen your professional networks and communities of practice. It will allow your work to have increased reproducibility and accuracy over time because of that. 
the pace of discovery can be you know uh, accelerated uh, the increased quality and diversity of your outputs can happen as well and uh, again those are kind of benefits that with some mindfulness you can measure for and track over time but that I'm confident you know you will uh, achieve uh, following the the big ideas of open science and the specific practices you pick up here in this community so I'm just going to talk maybe about some specific building blocks that might be helpful in achieving some of these things, talk about some challenges, uh, maybe some first steps, and then hopefully we'll have time for a few questions before we do the, the initial breakout room. We'll see if I can uh, amend things on the fly here to make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time. But so when we think about um, kind of building up that community I'm describing, those fair principles, being idea-minded, um, these are wonderful things. How you communicate those things is very important. You want them to be findable as well. So it would encourage you as you go forward to think about having the um, about statement. What is your work all about? How can you explain it in an accessible way? Uh, not in a rushed manner, but relatively quickly to those who are interested, who are thinking about maybe where to put their time and their contributions into some work in open knowledge. Uh, have an idea of what your mission is. What is it that you do? That should be very clear and have an idea of what your values are. What are the guiding principles for how we accomplish that mission? That will help people understand and trust your space as one that is open and safe for them to bring you know, their best selves and contributions to as well. Um, though there are different viewpoints uh, about codes of conduct, there are different names for codes of conduct uh, all around the world, I would encourage you to adopt one. You, know, you don't have to start from scratch, but in your work, uh, in your community, I would strongly encourage you to have a code of conduct that says, you know, here are the things, here's how we are going to be together. Here are the wonderful ways we're going to interact with one another. Here are the things we're not going to accept. Um, when things go wrong, you may not know the details of it all, but know that we are going to act and these are the steps we're going to follow. And then, you know, stick to that. That can build trust. That's a very strong document that I think is sometimes underappreciated, um, but is, I think, uh, necessary for communities, especially global ones, uh, local ones as well, all communities, we'll say. Um, you might also think about developing participation guidelines. So those are more about how people contribute to the, to the work itself while they are being together under the code of conduct. Um, your documentation uh, can be, you know, uh, the more clear you make it, especially for things that you might be using, like, I don't know, computational notebooks, ex uh, executable code, uh, the clearer your documentation is, the more that it exists somewhere, not just in the comments of the code, uh, the better it will be for others who might want to reuse it in the future. Um, feedback mechanisms. So you might have uh, some kind of uh, presence on a social network or a Slack instance, or even just a feedback form or a contact address for folks to let you know if they have a question, if they found a bug, uh, bug reports being the next thing. Just have a way to get some feedback from the folks that you hope to help through your work. That can be a, a wonderful thing, a wonderful way to get involved. You know, like I noticed this thing went wrong. I would love it to go right. Um, can you work on that for me? That's a, a lovely thing to do for a community member. Have some idea of your privacy policies and data and deletion policies. Again, these are things you can adopt, uh, adapt if you uh, don't have them yet, or you might belong to a larger institution that already has them and you can follow them. Um, I would monitor the things that you build. If something is important enough for you to invest your time into it um, as a, you know, a, a blog, a Slack instance, part of your, your, your methods, your inquiry, same thing, right? Whatever you build, you know, monitor it, make sure it is doing what you intend it to do. And if it's not, think about how you might change it to uh, better suit your needs and really only build what you need. And this has to do with data collection as well as everything else. Um, especially, you know, perhaps as you're you're starting out or you're a smaller team, a smaller lab, an individual, you want to be able to manage the things that you're doing without burning yourself or your team or your community members or frequent volunteers out. So try to stay, you know, aligned with your mission uh, as often as possible. And it's super tempting and at times super wonderful to talk with like-minded people to get really excited about potential collaborations and have a million things you could do. Uh, but if those things are taking you away from the one thing that you think you must do, um, you know, that you will, you will, you will feel that burn very quickly. Um, so again, try to only build what you need and operate in a mission aligned way. 
You'll learn uh, a bit about permissive and protective licensing. So permissive licensing, you might think of Creative Commons, public domain licenses that say, hey, you can use this work, uh, go ahead and use it. Or you can use this work if you credit the folks who build it. Or you can use this work if you credit the folks who build it and then let people use your work in the same way. There are these you know, permissive licenses uh, that are especially good, I think, for content that you might like. Um, and can really help with uh, disseminating open science uh, versus the more protective forms such as patents, uh, well, patents, trademarks, uh, more strict uh, interpretations and um, enforcement of copyright where you're like, no, that, that's mine, not yours. You cannot use it in that way. So um, as you move forward, think about how you might license your content permissively. Same thing with code. Um, there are a number of code-based licenses that operate probably uh, in a better fit way for code if you have that as part of your project, the MIT license. There's a Mozilla public license, uh, GNU, a new public license. Those are things you can research and kind of pick what best suits uh, any work you're doing in code as well. Um, a couple of other little things you can do to help build trust uh, to work towards this advancement of high quality science is to plan for a bit of community or user research. You know, reach out to those folks that you think the science you're doing will benefit before you begin it or while it's happening or afterwards. And, you know, ask them about their wants, their needs, their expectations, and those can help inform your design, whether it's for communication or experimentation. Um, and try to design against problems people present you with or pain points, not only for specific or suggested solutions. And, and what I mean is, if you can talk to three people, I bet all of those three people, even if they have the same kind of pain point or the same kind of like problem or challenge they're facing, they probably have three different ideas about how to go about it. So I think try to be less worried about following up on and meeting folks' expectations in an open community for exactly what they think will solve the problem. And instead, try to build some consensus around what the problem is and then design a solution that helps the most people uh, overcome that challenge uh, together. And then finally, you know, just be present where your community is. So um, I think about it in terms of like anchors and waves, have a couple of presences, maybe a Slack instance, something else where um, you are managing it. It's a space governed by your code of conduct. It's a place folks can gather. They know you're going to be there. Uh, but then also, you know, push out um, newsletters, other spaces where folks are, Blue Sky, Mastodon come to mind right now um, as places where pre-review tries to go, LinkedIn. Um, they'll be different for each project, right? Um, they may not be major social media channels at all. Um, but in addition to having your anchor point, um, you know, inform people, share with people not only what you're doing, but opportunities where they could help you, where they could contribute um, as those opportunities come up. And those are the, the ways that I think of. And same thing, uh, those ways might also be when you're ready to share your, your outputs, whether it's an invitation to review a preprint or something further along in the publication cycle, um, whether it's, uh, you know, something more like an article or, or more like code, um, you can use those kind of waves as well. And they might be regular waves, they might be not at set intervals, but when you have something to share that you would like feedback on, and it could be before, during, or after, you know, send out those waves of communication, I think. All right, we're kind of doing okay on time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit maybe about some, some challenges and then rush through making a plan because we'll get to more concrete steps later on. So we have question time before uh, the breakout room. But I think the biggest challenge with open science, with openness in general, is maybe knowing when to be open and when to be closed and like the immense pressure one can feel to try to be open all the time, which is not necessarily always the best to do. So I think there are times to be closed when you need to protect people's dignity and safety. Um, I think there are probably times to be open when maybe there's something to share. You're not, you know, maybe it's a, a piece of the science, maybe it's a product, maybe it's something you've built and you're not sure how people are going to take it rather than holding on to it until you think it's absolutely perfect. Maybe let that piece go a little bit earlier, maybe be more open with that piece, get feedback earlier in its lifespan. Um, I think that can help you be methodical. You can set up kind of routines or cadences or processes or rituals for getting that feedback as you go. Um, I think you don't necessarily have to share with the world and invite all the risks that you might anticipate uh, in a project, but doing some risk assessment beforehand, maybe with a smaller team, here are the kinds of things that we think might uh, be difficult or go wrong. Um, 
here's how important we think they are or how likely they are, and here's how we might respond. Uh, that could be a relatively closed process, but one that can help you uh, deal uh, in a way that seems transparent when things do go wrong, when when you are ready for things uh, to go wrong and you're like, well, this is not going to be fun, but we, we know what to do. Uh, and for me, part of that over the years, um, I'm somebody who rehearses apologies uh, an awful lot. Um, so when I uh, anticipate that I will get something wrong, which is a, a number of things when you facilitate, uh, there, you have lots of opportunities to get things wrong, uh, rehearsing for different kinds of, uh, of mistakes and understanding the consequences of those mistakes, I think is something to do as an open community or open science leader. Um, when you can, whenever possible, but again, without endangering yourself or others, find the edges of the bureaucracies, institutions, and traditions that you're in and try to open up pathways where they are unduly closed. Um, and as much as possible, and I think this work is a wonderful example of your commitment to this, you know, invest in your own kind of personal facilitation and listening practices, um, just under that idea of seeking first to understand and then to move onward together, um, you know, lead folks where they want to go rather than where you think they should go uh, can be good. And then if you were to, to make a plan, you know, uh, the, the big, uh, the, the guardrails I would think about around a plan would be, you know, open as much of the science as you can, protect the people as much as you can, plan things, make them, share them and get feedback all along the way. And again, uh, future modules here are going to help you do this with project management, tooling, data, and things like that. Um, there are a few links here uh, going towards some of the content, especially things I covered very briefly today that you can go into in much more depth um, in, in the coming week or ahead of your next session as well. Um, how are we doing for time? Should we do a couple of questions here or should we talk about the, the breakout room? A couple of questions? Yeah. Give give people some room to stretch their brains before they yes. have to talk to everyone. Absolutely. So, any questions? And those could be out loud uh, in the doc, uh, in the chat. Telepathically, if you are more advanced telepathically than I am, I, I could probably receive. I cannot send. Ted, it's clear you're just such an absolutely captivating speaker that, and so clear that nobody had a single question for you. Yes, <laughs> very important. The key of open science, always be kind if not truthful. No, no, no. But that's the thing, right? I mean, when you don't anticipate room for questions, you're actually listening to it rather keenly. It's not so much as, oh, he's saying something. And then I'm like, okay. But I'm, I, I want to sort of challenge those thoughts or something like that because I'm just mm -hmm. like imbibing everything you were saying. But now you put us on the spot by asking us to ask. Oh, but it's, it is an expansive spot. <laughs> so please feel free to, to stretch into it. There are a couple of questions coming in now. No, it's pretty uh, much the same stuff. I think like all of us are just like, mm, yeah. I also made notes of pretty much the same thing. Like, okay, this is a new definition for fair. I mean, I kind of liked it because it sort of embodies the previous stuff that we learned the, on Tuesday. So yeah, it was, yeah. Cool. Anyway, I hope cool. others have questions. Yeah, I saw one in the chat, um, more details uh, about FAIR. Maybe we'll start there and we'll come back to the document where folks are, are typing. Um, so I th when I think about FAIR now and in, in the context of pre-review, just to make things kind of very concrete, one of the things we're doing right now is rebuilding our recommendation and search features. So we're, we're a website that, um, a, a platform that helps people author preprint review. So open peer preprint review. Uh, we don't host the preprints and we display the reviews, although they're hosted on the back end on Zenodo. But the previous version of search on the site just didn't work. Like that code base came from a long time ago. And you would think, oh, you know, there's search, so it's going to help me find, you know, whatever it is I want on the site. But the search results that were coming up were also not like working. They were not the correct search results. They were not the best search results. So we're trying to rebuild it now and to build a recommendation engine alongside of it um, in, in such a way that um, folks can get kind of like exactly what they're asking for, but 
also, you know, what we provide. So we're trying to make our pre-reviews, as we call them, the reviews of the preprints that folks author on our site, more findable. So if you come to us, you can find recent reviews right now. We do kind of share those, but it's a, it's a small list. It's like five at a time. You have to go back in time again and again and again to find things. We haven't reinstituted search yet. So we're thinking about, you know, like, what do people really want to find in those pre-reviews? Are they looking for pre-reviews to read? Are they looking for articles, pre-print articles that have reviews already that they can add more reviews to? Um, we're doing like all of that research and then that will help us make what people really want findable to be as findable as possible. And then in terms of accessibility, for example, like one of the things we want to work on this year um, uh, is more localization and translation, starting with a few communities that do an awful lot of uh, review activity uh, on the site. Um, in terms of things that are interoperable, uh, we have a request to review feature that we started that's built on something called the core notify protocol, which is like more of a coalition uh, with a protocol that sets up these kind. Of, they're explained to me as inboxes where different services can communicate different things back and forth to each other based on um, commonly interpreted metadata. So that brings us to that interoperable piece. So that's an example of interoperability. Folks can request reviews of preprints um, on a couple of our par uh, sites we integrate with that then come into our um, Slack community so that our Slack community can kind of see those things. Uh, and then for reusable, um, again, our, our, our dev is super documentation. So for example, like we're trying to take that work we're doing with core, that interoperable request to review work and document it in such a way that anybody using this type of plugin for content management or editorial workflow can pick it up and use it again almost, you know, immediately with just a little bit of consultation with us to, to set up the right parameters for the communication between the, the systems. So, you know, thinking about how, well, what do people really want to find and understand from the work and how do I, how do we, uh, how do we gear it, how, whether it's search or, or a report or the organization, the table of contents, right, whatever it is, how do we set it up so that people can find what it is they tell us they want to find rather than what we assume? Um, how can we make it as accessible as possible? Like, how can we learn enough about our audiences to understand the different ways we should be sharing something? Um, interoperable, is there, you know, something other folks are using that if we used it too, it would strengthen the collaboration, cooperation opportunities between our communities? And reusable, are we documenting enough? And are we keeping our technical standards at a level where others could reasonably uh, achieve the same? Um, with similar or lesser resources, I think is a way to think about that. So um, just I have a follow-up to that. Do you, are you um, uh, hosting your review? So on the, let me back up. When sure. you request a peer review, um, mm -hmm. are, how, how are you determining who you request a peer review from? Uh, it, we, we're working with two preprint servers right now who are our pilots, and their requests go to a particular channel in our Slack instance called Request a Review. And so anybody in our Slack community can see those requests, and we're working on ways to um, make them more findable by like keyword discipline, things like that, more filterable even on a quick read through so that if you are uh, more, let's say, of a humanities scholar, uh, you, you can key in on uh, the requests that are more germane or relevant to you. Okay. And then your the reviews that are done are then posted mm -hmm. on Zenodo. Is that is yeah? We we also display them on our site. We pull that information back, but they're they're stored on Zenodo. Yep. All right. Looking at the doc, a uh, couple more things. Um, she you has know, an I, idea. Yes. Can Time I ask out? you to write those uh, write mm -hmm. answers? We also have one from Dr. Salwan about uh, peer review. But if I could just ask you to write the answers to those, and maybe yes. just introduce the breakout rooms. Yep. Perfect. Absolutely. I shall make a little note to myself. All right. Breakout rooms. Here we go. And then when you come back, there will magically be answers. Fantastic. Um, so one of the ways I just like to preface breakout uh, groups again is with a very, very clear structured ask so everybody can understand how to be together. I think that's great in an open setting. Um, in these rooms, please go ahead and introduce yourself briefly in any way that you'd like to be known by your group. Maybe just a sentence. Remember to be kind. Remember to speak one nth of the time. So if there are five of you, speak a fifth of the time. Please try to share just one thing at a time, and then somebody else will share one thing, and then there'll be time to kind of go around uh, the group. Um, 
You can offer affirmations, plus ones. You might ask clarifying questions. Oh, I didn't quite understand that. Like we were just talking more about fair. You might offer a helpful suggestion or a resource, uh, but this is definitely not the time to like uh, pose and quote unquote win uh, arguments, debates, find the perfect solutions. That's not the purpose at all. Um, and if you need any help, click on that help button and a host will come and join you. We'll do about 10 to 15 minutes here, maybe a little bit less because clearly I'm going over time. Um, but what I'd like you to do here is to kind of get into that ethos of, of openness. I'd like you to think about a time from your own experience, any point in your life, when you felt wholly included, valued, and re recognized within a group that you also valued. Um, if each person could just briefly share that memory, that'd be great. That'd be the one thing, and then you'd go around. And then when you get to the second cycle in the group, Tell about a part of that experience that you would like to bring to others in your open science community, in your project, in your lab, in your institution. What is a piece of that past experience that meant so much to you that you think is key to openness as we've begun to understand it together that you would like to bring to others going forward? And if you could capture your notes on this in the doc, that'd be great. And when we come back, we'll have time to quickly share insights. So if there are any big ideas from your discussion, any big questions, anything you absolutely want to share with the group that is, um, you know, you just want to highlight it before we go on, there'll be time for that. Any questions about that? And yes, I would say peer review can be included in open science if it's done in an open way, but there are plenty of closed peer review systems too. All right. If there are no questions, I will leave it to um, the host to open up those breakout rooms and then we'll be back together soon. Okay. Um, Anna, I hope that you're ready for a written room. I needed to add someone else to written rooms just to keep things smooth. But other than that, rooms are opening now, my friends. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Baldatu, uh, Joanna, I just want to check you can move, okay? But perfect, thank you. So, um, just some again, uh, I like operating on big ideas with some examples. So if I don't give enough examples, you know, uh, make note of that somewhere, whether it's a question in the chat, and I'll come back during the next breakout room and answer again. Um, but first, I think it's really important to do what you say that you do. And this is not only for kind of like trustworthiness with your community, but also for uh, your own personal ecology and self-care. Really think about your mission and vision as you go forward. Think about all the different opportunities for collaboration that you have, all the different invitations you could make, and focus on the ones that help you do what you think is most important. And in that way, you'll be able to preserve yourself and your capacity and that of your team and your community uh, towards meeting that, that particular goal. Um, think about, you know, operations, think about your capacity, the size of your team, think about the type of organization you are, think about the value exchanges that you might have with community members when you ask for feedback, when you invite a review, um, what is it that you are offering back? And it's not always financial, uh, it's not always like quid pro quo, it could often be altruistic, uh, but do have an idea of kind of what is it that we want to do? What are we asking of ourselves and is that reasonable? And then what are we asking of community members and our, what are we offering them in return? What are we trying to give back to them um, that would you know, seem equitable to us? And you can also ask them that would seem equitable to them uh, to get the feedback that we're, we're trying to get. Um, Doing what you say you do can also help with, you know, funders who are looking for very particular things. Um, we have, you know, had many of those conversations. People are very interested in what they're interested in, especially uh, when, when they become funders. And so um, knowing if you align with them or not can really help you maybe save time and talk to the right funders earlier uh, in your kind of sustainability lifespan. 
Uh, I would have that code of conduct and I would stick to it. Um, you know, not having a code of conduct is not great. Having a code of conduct and then ignoring it or doing something or making exceptions, et cetera, things like that is even worse. So have a code of conduct, stick to it. There's a wonderful resource out there from Frameshift Consulting called something very utilitarian. It's like Responding to Code of Conduct Reports is the name of the book. It's exactly that. It's fantastic. Um, and then your data and privacy policies. Uh, how you protect folks, how you protect their information, when you delete it, stick to that. Be trustworthy there. Um, I would encourage you always to go onward together. Try not to go alone. Uh, always try to have a leadership team. Try to have you know a community group, uh, multiple advisors. Just uh, the more you can kind of spread the load, especially at the beginning of a project, the more you can protect one another from burnout. Do be accountable for what you say you're going to do and, and try to deliver on it. And again, when you make those mistakes, you know, own them, understand the consequences, learn from them uh, and move ahead. I think on a small team, it's important to agree on who might lead what. Like if someone loves being the community person, maybe they lead the community work. If someone loves being the documentation person, maybe they lead the documentation work. But everyone can help each other, right? Especially in a small team. Um, be ready to pitch in, but also have an idea of who might lead on particular things so you know they're going to get done. They're not going to get lost in committee, so to speak. I would encourage you to broaden your idea of stakeholders you know, you might get help from areas you never anticipate. And I try to remind myself all the time that the largest group of people who can help me are the people who have not helped me yet. And so I think about how to engage more people all the time, but also I think about how to make what I'm asking specific so people know if it's a good fit, uh, if they can do it, if they want to do it, if it's a good use of their time. Um, so specific invitations can help even while you're trying to engage more different kinds of people with your work. Again, come back to that idea of equitable value exchanges. Talk with your community members. Hey, if we were to ask you to give this kind of input or participate in this, or maybe consider donating this kind of data, would this be an okay thing to get back from us? You can learn a lot that way. Um, and think about how you might draw not only from other people, but from other disciplines for planning. So there are things out there in the world. Um, many of you have probably encountered these called canvases, sometimes a lean, a lean canvas, an open canvas, a business canvas. It's an organizer for thinking about how to begin something that can be helpful. Um, I've talked in the past, my colleagues in Mozilla have talked in the past about a, a mountain of engagement. So thinking about, you know, someone finds your project, What's their next step up this mountain? Like, what's the next thing they can do with you? What's the next collaboration? And then whether they get to the top or they never get to the top and they just hang out, you know, somewhere in the middle of the mountain, um, how do you check in with them to make sure they're getting what they want from each level of engagement with you? There's something called a, the SWOT analysis, which stands for, sorry, third acronym. Oh, no. Uh, strengths weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that's something you can think about your project. You know, what strengths are we beginning with? What are perhaps some weaknesses that we should think about addressing? What opportunities do we have to, to do open science in different ways here? And, you know, what are the threats? What are the challenges? What are the things we really need to pay attention to so that those mistakes or uh, accidents or occurrences, you know, don't, um, don't stop us in our tracks, so to speak. Um, Code of conduct reporting, follow-up templates, lots of places have great codes of conduct available. You can uh, adapt those things. You don't have to start from, from scratch there. Um, think about other platforms maybe that do the things you don't do. So for example, uh, pre-review, we author and hit the button to publish reviews of preprints. However, Zenodo hosts those reviews and other servers host the preprints. So we're not trying to do all of those things. We're trying to do that act of authorship for folks who are interested in open preprint review. But we use other platforms to help us where we don't want to recreate something or build something or host something ourselves. And this could also be for workflows. So if there's something out there like um, GitHub Project Board or Airtable or any of these other kinds of productivity softwares, there might be you know a nonprofit discount or even a free version that might help you in your work that you could draw from there. Um, and that, that, again, would apply to planning and workflow tools. I would think about adopting organizational principles and work styles that kind of like fit your team. So whether it's a roadmap or another way to plan, you know, figure out a way to plan together that makes sense to you so you understand who's doing what, when, how you know what success looks like, when you're going to have uh, opportunities to check in. Um, 
you know, have a, have a roadmap. That's, that's a good thing to have. There's a, a rather broad kind of distinction or categorization of, of work in some of the spaces I've been in that has something called waterfall on one side and agile or sometimes scrum on the other. These are things you can go off and learn about. I won't get too deep into them today here, except that in an agile setting, you kind of do small pieces of work and then you release them and test them and keep building on them over time so that many smaller pieces fit into a larger hole by the time you're done. Waterfall tends to wait until the big thing is done and then it releases the huge thing all at once. The drawback being if any one little part that hasn't been tested yet breaks, the whole thing can break there. Um, and we often sometimes will take one piece of software and use it for a different purpose rather than buying two pieces of software or the licenses because we're a small organization. Uh, so certainly encourage you to find creative workarounds with the resources available to you as well uh, as you're on that sustainability journey. And then, you know, I think probably most importantly is just to be dependable, develop rituals, empower others. So, you know, uh, it goes back to do the thing that you say you're going to do, whether it's following your mission towards the outcome you want in the open science space or following your data guidelines or following your code of conduct guidelines. Be dependable. Um, develop your rituals. That goes kind of back to communications to other things, right? Like uh, when you have those waves of communication, maybe you have a newsletter, maybe you have somebody who does regular updates in social media spaces, maybe you have a monthly community call where you gather feedback from folks using your science, but establishing kind of habits or rituals where you are communicating certain things dependably, getting feedback dependably, all that can kind of help you build trust, uh, but also increase the, the value you give and uh, receive from your community members over time. Um, you might think about uh, federation as well. At Mozilla, sometimes we often thought about like kits, like, oh, here's a thing we do. If we want other people to be able to do the same thing, how could we document that into a kit that we could post online or send by email, just give to people, and then they could do something similar if they wanted to. Um, so we thought of that as a like federation, taking what we were doing centrally and making sure folks could do that wherever they were if they wanted to do something that was the same. So documentation helps with that, kits help with that. Programs like this, where you might think of it as a train the trainers or you know train the open scientists kind of uh, opportunities as well. And then finally, um, in terms of empowering others, as you go along and you see what kinds of contributions folks are making to your project, whether they're on your team or they're community members coming in through another kind of open pathway, think about multipliers and returners. So think about the folks who keep coming back to contribute again and again. Talk with them, understand what motivates them to do so, so that you can share those things with others. And your multipliers, the folks who go out and then bring other people to you, ask them, how are they doing that? And then that can help you figure out appropriate value exchanges for those multipliers. But you can also learn from them how to engage more people with your own work if they happen to be you know, bringing in lots of people all the time that you're not yet able to reach. All right, we're probably just a time for a short breakout room before we do closing activities, right? So I will say if there are questions, um, we'll have short Q&A afterwards, but we're going to try a second breakout room here. We'll maybe make it like a an eight-minute one. Uh, the same guidelines in terms of introducing yourself if it's a new group, being kind, speaking one part of the time, and passing things along. But I'd like you to just dream for a moment about the work you intend to do here in this cohort, uh, the work you intend to take from it and to continue afterwards. Think about your project. Think about what happens if your project were to succeed beyond your wildest expectations. Like, think about the most successful version of your project you possibly could. And then I want you to think about, like, two things. One, what is a practical, structural, maybe technical thing you want to have in place sooner rather than later that you think is essential to your vision of success? So what's something that's an actionable next step that is a practical, structural, or technical thing you could do to advance that vision of success. And then second, what's that cultural or values or community-based thing you could do to ensure that success as well? So what's the very like, here is a logistical thing we're going to do as part of the work to make it a success? And then what's that relational, community-based, open science-based, like, what do you really want to focus on there that you think is necessary for your vision of success? Those two things to share if we have time for that.
Any questions about those prompts? All right, let's open the rooms. Let's try for like, oh, six to eight minutes, come back for a quick shared insights. And then that probably will give us a few minutes of questions and then um, we'll be able to close the call. Yeah, let me see. Oh, I I think I messed this up. I'm gonna try again. We create an assigning. Okay. Automatically, but if you want to take notes uh, on the pad, uh, there's space in there for your groups as well. I think. Yeah, let me move people around. Um, Thank you. Just give me a, a few minutes. Because I, yeah. Let's yeah. let's aim for maybe like so, a an abbreviated <laughs> breakout room. We'll do about six minutes. Okay. And why don't each yeah, of us pick works. one of those two things to share with the group? Pick either the kind of procedural, not necessarily mechanical, but like, you know, logistical system space thing that you want to have in place, or pick that kind of like cultural thing you'd like to have in place and think about um what what how you'd like to begin. In terms of that uh, that ethos. Almost ready. Almost ready. Great. Thank you. Yeah. If there are any questions, um, I can answer them in the chat at a Docker out loud too. Might have time for a question. Never know. So Chad, on your yeah. on your peer reviews, do you do you pay uh, the peer reviewers or is it purely volunteer? Uh, uh, at this point, it's it's uh, voluntary. Um, we have clubs that organize activity uh, for collaborative reviews as well. Um, our user research opportunities, though, we do try to um, provide uh, honoraria for for those contributions. All right, thank you for opening the breakout rooms. Yeah, thank you for the patience here. Um, have I'll a, just know if you need help getting to yours. I think have a. Do you have a preference whether you want to go into a breakout room for speaking participation, for spoken participation, or written participation? I will. I, will um, I I just missed the confirmation of my breakout room. Mm -hmm. How can I get it back? Okay, you are in breakout room nine. Um, let me see if I can. Yeah. Hey, there John. we go. All right. A minute countdown when the room's closed. So I said. Yeah. feels so suspenseful to me. I don't know why. The same thing happens every time. <laughs> so it's five seconds until everyone is back. Yep. Here we go. All right, welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for joining that second breakout room. Uh, we've just got a few minutes before we want to start closing. So if you have a big idea, a big question, a shared insight kind of piece, please add it either to the shared insight section of the notes under breakout room two or just to the notes for your room. That would be great, too. I see many of you uh, doing that now. Um, but are there uh, any questions uh, in these Again, if you add them to the document, I'll answer them there if we run out of time. But we probably have time for one or two questions, if anybody has any. Oh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, today, I've been having some issues with my internet. So I've joined the meeting quite late. I was asking mm -hmm. if you could direct me to where I can find the recording for this session. Thank you. 
I'll, I'll answer, I'll take that one. Um, so the recordings will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. We take a few days um, to correct the auto transcription. So it won't be immediately after the meetings, uh, but we're going to let you know uh, in the welcome email for it, for the second week, uh, whether those recordings are already in the channel. Um, yeah, so that's where you will find them. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and then I saw this question earlier about does open science, do open science practices include preprints? I would say, you know, preprints as part of the scholarly communication process can be open or closed. Uh, it depends probably on where they're shared, uh, how they're being reviewed, things like that. You could have a group that says uh, you have to deposit a preprint here, but our preprint server is closed and we have our own group of uh, anonymous reviewers, in which case it would not be particularly open. Or you might have a preprint server that says, you know, each thing that's published here is published publicly. And there's a comment feature and anybody can comment on it and it might be significantly more open. Um, so I think each step of the process is not, um, it's not dictated so much by where in the, the process of science, whether something is open or closed, but more in the um, avenues to it in terms of right findability, reproducibility, accessibility, that's around it maybe. And with that, I will say uh, you can find me uh, online. Uh, my handle is just uh, just like my uh, Zoom handle here. Uh, first name, last name, all lowercase, one word. Uh, chad at prereview.org also works. Uh, and if you'd like to chat about any of these things further, uh, I, I would love to as well. Thank you all for having me today. Oh, Esther, do you want to... Ask that yes. question quickly okay. in the chat or the doc, and I could answer it there. Okay, okay. I have, I've written the question in the doc already, but you haven't yet responded to me. Oh, no. Can I just read it out? Or... Uh, where is it in the doc? I'll go find it. It's in, uh, below the comment of from you. Okay. Thank you. I'll go find it. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, Chad, for joining us and, and this at the end of this first week of the cohort. Uh, can we please give Chad a round of applause, please? Yes. Thank you all very much. Thank you. So we have three minutes left and I just want to um, share some announcements. And I'm going to share my screen because I also want to show you how to give us feedback. Um, just taking the comments that Chad just shared about the importance of feedback, we have a space for that in the pad. And I want to share the screen really, really quickly. Okay. Can you see that? Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see your okay. screen. Thank you. So um, first, the announcements is that you're going to receive an email at the beginning of next week, just uh, with a reminder of the cohort goals um, for the week of tools and resources. Um, and also expect an email very, very soon with um, the email introduction with your coach. We are finalizing the matching between projects and, and experts, um, and you will get instructions of, of the next steps about the coaching sessions as well. And with respect to feedback, um, last week, someone shared with us uh, that they would like a reminder for the sessions by email. So the calendar invites are now configured um, to send you an email half an hour before the session and also a pop-up notification um, the day before. So we do read the feedback and we will take it into consideration uh, if you share it with us, it's really, really important for us to learn how the cohort is going for you and whether there's something that you liked, whether, whether there's something that you want to change, um, something that surprised you, anything that you want to share. And we have a um, section in this week's notepad for feedback. So please take a couple of minutes after the cohort call ends and share with us uh, your ideas in this space. Here it is.
So I'm gonna stop sharing and let me see if there's anything in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Samira. We're gonna copy that comment on the uh, notepad so that um, everyone else can also read it. Um, everyone who couldn't join or who had to drop off early. Um, but yeah, so this is the uh, this is the end of the cover call, and I'm really really happy that you could all join. Um, and also happy for people who are going to watch the recording later. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining and I'm going to, I'm going to stop the recording now.